Okay guys, in this video lesson, we're gonna take the next step in our unit. We've already discussed conservation of energy and how energy can transfer from one thing to another thing. And we looked primarily at you know gravitational potential energy, elastic potential energy, and kinetic energy, okay? Now we're gonna look at it through the lens of a collision. So what happens when two objects collide with each other, all right? Um, when you have a collision, it can be lots of things, okay? When we think of maybe a car crash or a football tackle is, is it comes to my mind, um, but a collision is also a dancer landing on the ground or bouncing a basketball or hooking two crane cars together or a slap shot in hockey or even just drumming off of a, off with the drumsticks. Those are all collisions where two different objects are hitting each other. Now, one might be stationary and one might be moving to start, but there's still some sort of contact there that creates that collision, all right? One thing we need to re remember about collisions or kind of put in our brains really early on is that in all real world collisions, we see a loss in calculable kinetic energy. Okay, What we mean by that is in any time you actually have two things collide with each other, okay, we, we somehow lose some kinetic energy. So it goes someplace else. Okay? We put this in quotes because it isn't actually lost. It's not like the energy dissipates into our environment. We don't know where it goes. We can identify where it goes, but we don't necessarily calculate um, where it goes. Okay. Um, now, within that parameters, there are two different types of real-world collisions. Okay. We give them two different names. We call them in inelastic collisions and then perfectly inelastic collisions, okay? And we're gonna cover each one of these independently in our upcoming slides, all right? So let's get to it. So first thing we wanna hit is an inelastic collision, all right? Now, inelastic collision doesn't mean it's rigid and doesn't mean it doesn't flex, it doesn't mean that, okay? So sometimes we see the word inelastic and we think of really solid, hard, that kind of stuff. Um, and actually, the opposite kind of happens here where when you have an inelastic collision, the kinetic energy we're dealing with is lost, and the object is going to deform, okay? So think about a car, okay? When a car collides with another car or a wall or a fire hydrant or a pole or whatever it hits, okay, some sort of accident, that car crumples up, okay? So you bend the metal, you crush the bumper, you the airbags go off, you know, things break, that kind of stuff. All of that crumpling absorbs some of the energy. Okay, so when we say that kinetic energy is lost, it's, it's lost to this deformation of that object. Okay, it also generates heat because anytime you bend metal, that heats it up. There's going to be light coming off it. You can hear sounds coming off it. So there's lots of different places that the energy that we lose from kinetic goes into these other locations. Typically, we don't really care to calculate how much heat was formed or the, the energy that gets converted into light or sound. We just group them all together and say this is the lost energy. Okay, What that means for us is we can actually take in a calculation and anytime you have an inelastic collision and two things collide, we actually can calculate that change in kinetic energy now. All right. So what we're looking for is the kinetic energy before, the kinetic energy after, and we should see a change. We should see a loss, which means the kinetic energy after should be less than the kinetic energy before. Okay, so here's how we do it. Um, we need to first of all break it down by the initial kinetic energy and the final kinetic energy. So initially, the kinetic energy is going to be one half mv squared of object one. So we have little ones in here. Okay, because we have two objects, so we need to make sure that we're dealing with both objects at the same time. Okay plus the kinetic energy of object two. So this is object one right here. This is object two right here, okay? And then we're gonna set that comparative to kinetic energy final, which is the same exact things. It's object one and object two, but notice how here we have Fs for the velocities instead. Okay? We're gonna assume for the most part that mass doesn't change, okay? Um, but the velocities are going to be the things that change here, all right? So we're really dealing with how, the speeds at which things are moving beforehand and after, which is nice because if you have one object stationary, let's say object one is driving a car and object two is a brick wall, well, object two is a brick wall. It's not moving, so there's zero velocity. So this part of the equation can go to a zero again, okay? So a lot of times, again, even though these equations can get really big, we look for those places that where can we put insert zeros to simplify our equation. Which means our change in kinetic energy is our final minus our initial. So it can be all of this minus 
all of that. Okay, so it can get kind of long. Now, things we should be looking for. First of all, the answer should be negative. Okay, if it's an elastic collision. All right, so we're looking for a negative result here or a negative change in energy. All right. However, if the answer is zero. Okay, let's say you do all your math and you come up with a with a scenario where you have zero change in kinetic energy, then no energy is lost, which means this is not an inelastic collision. Okay, that would also mean that this is not a real world collision. Okay, so that if we get to a scenario where we have zero energy change, that means we're dealing with a hypothetical or just a theoretical scenario, and we'll actually talk about what those are uh, later on in this in our notes. Okay, so that's our inelastic collision. We lose energy, objects deform as they collide. Now, one thing they don't do is they don't stick together, okay? So they hit and they bounce off each other. So that's a key piece because if we have a perfectly inelastic collision, what makes it perfect is that they still lose energy, and when they collide, they actually stick together, okay? Um, a great example of that is a train car rolling down and hitting another train car, and they latch to each other, and now they become one. Okay, so in that case, we have this sticking together. Okay, a football tackle would be another example of that, where you know you hit somebody, you tackle them, and you go to the ground together at the same time. That would be another example of things sticking together. Okay, um, a slap shot in hockey would not be because there's a collision between the puck and the stick, but afterwards the puck and the stick are separate from each other. Okay, so some examples for you. We still get a loss of energy. Same reasons, heat, light, sound, deformation, um, what is used to hold those objects together takes that energy. Lots of things that cause that to happen, all right? Um, a car crash could be perfectly inelastic. If they collide and the two cars kind of get mangled together, then it would be perfectly inelastic. If they collide and bounce off each other, which is what normally happens, then it would be just inelastic. Okay, some different examples for you. In this case, there is really no need to calculate the change in kinetic energy. Okay, because you know that they stick together, right? So if they stick together, you know it's perfectly inelastic, all right? We may still ask you to do this. We may say, okay, this is a perfectly inelastic collision. Now tell us what the change in kinetic energy is here. So we may still ask you to perform that calculation. But if we are asking you the what type of collision is it and um, to identify it, you don't need to do a calculation to do that, okay? Um, for inelastic collisions, you do, because anytime two things bounce off each other, you need to run the calculation to check to see if it's a zero, okay? Um, but when they stick together, you know they can't be zero. It has to be perfectly inelastic, all right? Now, let's talk about that theoretical world. So what happens if you have this ideal scenario where there is no deformation, there is no energy loss to thermal, there is no energy loss to bending or sound or light or those kind of things? What would we call that or how would we identify that? Well, that's when we use the term elastic collision, all right? So remember, this is not the real world. We're now in theory land, okay? This is all hypothetical in here. Um, we use this, though, because a lot of times in the real world, we're trying to get to the perfect world, right? So a lot of times we want our collisions to be as elastic as possible. Think of um, a golf club off of a golf ball, okay? They want all the kinetic energy from that golf club to be transferred into that golf ball. So they want to make the collision as elastic as possible. That way the golf ball leaves the head of the golf club as fast as it possibly can do that. Same thing for a tennis racket or a slap shot, those kind of things. There's always going to be some inelastic characteristics of those things, but engineers and designers are looking to make them as inelastic, or sorry, make them as elastic as possible or get them as close to perfect as possible. Okay? So in this theoretical world, we call these elastic collisions. We see no energy loss, need to, no deformation of those objects, okay? Um, which will result in no change in kinetic energy. So this again kind of correlates back to our inelastic collision. So if we think it's inelastic, we get a scenario, and we do the calculations, and we come up with a zero, we now know it's not inelastic, but instead it's a theoretical problem that's elastic instead. Okay, so that's our decision making is if we do a solve, if we do solve for change in kinetic energy and we come up with zero, we now have an elastic collision and we have a theoretical scenario only. All right. Now, some things that come really close, playing a game of pool is really close because you have really hard ceramic uh, 
balls that hit against each other. There's very little deformation and there's very little kinetic energy loss in a game of pool. Now, we do hear it when they hit, so there is some, but it's very little. Uh, another one is um, high bouncy balls. High bouncy balls are great. Uh, you bounce them, you drop them, they come right back up to your hand. It seems like sometimes they even have more energy than they had before. They don't, but um, they come really close to that because even though they deform, they, they spring back to their original shape very quickly with very little loss of kinetic energy. So a high bouncy ball would be another thing you could find visualize that would get us close to a, an elastic collision. Now, last thing we want to talk about is this stuff in blue, and this is kind of important for us. We cannot use conservation of energy to solve for the mass or velocity of any real objects in a collision. Okay, So let's go back to our equation back here. We can use this to find the change in kinetic energy. We need to know the masses. We need to know the velocities. Okay, If you're given a problem and it says solve for the velocity after the collision, you can't do it. Okay, You could put the numbers in, um, but it won't work. Because if you don't know the change in kinetic energy, you can't make that, that solving process. Because you can't use conservation of energy. Okay, So what we're basically saying is if we go way back to this, we can't use this scenario if there's a collision. Okay, So um, we can use conservation of mechanical energy when things are just moving and changing heights, elastic, that kind of stuff. But if there's a collision, we no longer can use this equation because your kinetic energy mechanical before will not equal its after. So these are no longer an equality. Okay? So keep that in mind as we kind of move forward. Lots of things to click on here. With these collisions, that the only way that we can find masses and velocities is if we don't have a collision, okay, um, in our scenario. We will have a way to do that. We just can't do it with energy, okay? So in our next unit, we will talk about momentum. And what's nice about momentum is that momentum is conserved in our uh, collisions. So using energy, we're limited, where we can't solve for mass or velocity in a collision. But in our next unit, we'll have a way to do that instead, okay?